if you want more, we, we took more, but we didn't bring them all. So if you would want one, let us know. Do we know the time frame that they're due by? No, so November 20th, which is two, two weeks. Okay, so two weeks. Uh, December 11th, just a reminder, we're renting the building all the way till 2.30, so regular service. Then we're going to do a prophecy update, and then my pastor's coming to ordain me, so that'll be fun and exciting day, food and fun stuff. And then the other thing, um, as I was preparing my notes, and we're going to get to the part where Jesus says the fields are white, and then it's, it's ready for a harvest. Um, one way to do that today that I've found that's effective, for the past three years I've been doing Billy Graham online ministry. Uh, what I do is I coach different courses. So a person will, will make a profession for Christ and they'll get saved. And then there's these courses and it's very like Christianity 101. You know, what's the Holy Spirit? What, what's the Bible? Why you should attend church? And you just walk them through that and you ask questions and then they'll put up a verse and ask the person what they think. And you just walk them through that. There's also a texting way that you can actually text back. You're through the Billy Graham thing, so they don't have your number, so you don't get any weird stuff. Uh, so you can text them back and forth. And then there's also email. And it's just a great way to, to outreach. I, I wish I would have brought it. I took a screenshot and sent it to my supervisor in that a long time ago. And it was so neat. It was an older guy. He was in his 80s. And by the time he came to the end of the course, he said, Matt, I've never been assured of my salvation until I took this course and with your help. And there he is, 80 years old, and had gone out and done witnessing, and he just never felt sure till someone said, no, you're, you're sure, you're, you're on solid ground. So it's just a great way. I've had a few people come and get saved. I've had people from the Middle East, from Africa, from all over the world um, take this course. So if you're looking for a way to outreach, you don't even have to leave your house. So it's a good way. If you want to know more about it, I'll let you know. I'll point you to it um, in better detail later. And uh, I think that was all the announcements for the week. So we are in John chapter 4. We are going to say goodbye to the woman at the well. I enjoyed our time with her. Uh, John chapter 4, we're going to be beginning in verse 27. But just, just a little bit of a recap. Uh, remember the, the Samaritans and the Jews, there's, there's a lot of hostility between the two. Um, it's a prejudice. It's, it's a hate that has festered for years and no one's willing to compromise this. Uh, we talked about last week how the Samaritans had snuck on the Temple Mount and put dead bones all over it so they couldn't have Passover. The Jews went and burned down their temple, you know, years before that. Just this constant battle between the two of them. But Jesus takes this time to go to Samaria, and he takes this time to not only meet a group of people that were outcasted by the Jews, but to meet a, a woman, which again, which is shocking that he would meet a woman. We talked about how men did not even talk to women in public. A good Jewish man would not talk, but Jesus breaks all the barriers. He breaks all those rules, all the traditions, really. Uh, to meet this woman at the well. And it just went through my head the way the old King James says it. And I listen to Joe Foch a lot, and I just love the way uh, he repeats it. You know, Jesus must needs go to through Samaria because he had to get to this woman at the well. So just kind of a backdrop where we're at. We're saying goodbye to her. We finished with Jesus saying to her in verse 26 of chapter 4, I who speak to you am he. He was saying, I am Messiah. He makes this very clear declaration to her. He doesn't do very often. It's, it's crystal clear here. There's no doubt about it. It's funny. I was listening to other people, and they're like, you know, uh, critics of the Bible, they, Jesus never actually confessed to be Messiah. I'm like, have you read? Like, what are you talking about? Right here, it's clear as day. But he did. He confessed to be Messiah. I made it clear. So we're going to read down from verse 27. To verse 38, and my wife told me apparently last week I cleared my throat every two minutes, so I might be drinking water a little bit more. I'm sorry if that, that would annoy me like crazy, so I'm sorry I did that to you guys, but I'm scared to take a drink because I'm going to lose my place. So anyways, verse 27, and at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? 
Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives, for in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And as, well, we'll stop there. So we get the, the picture. She goes, she goes back down into the city. He's sitting with his disciples, and <laughs> he has to clue them in. But I love it how it says they came and they marveled he was talking to a woman. From the Mishnah, again, which is like a commentary on the rules that they made up as they went. I, I, this is right from the Mishnah. I copied this. Um, and it says, and don't carry on excessive conversation with a woman. This was said in relation to his wife, and all the more so it is true with the wife of a friend. This is the source for the rabbis who taught a person who converses excessively, excessively with a woman causes himself harm distracts himself from the Torah study, and in the end, he acquires Gehenna, or hell. <laughs> That's how strict they felt about this. So when the disciples come up and they see, and they're marveling that he's talking with the woman, this is probably what's running through their head. Most of the Jewish boys at this time would go through a school when they were younger, so they would have been taught this, they would have heard this, but they don't ask a question, and I like that because it's almost like, and the one commentator put it well, it says, it's almost like a holy hush came over them that they understood that something holy, something revered was happening right here. Because it says at this point, when the way that verse starts, and the last, remember, there's no breaks or spaces when this was originally written. It said, I who speak to you am he, and then it's at this point. So it's almost like that happens. They must be looking at each other, and then the disciples walk up. And they're looking, you know, she's looking at him. He's look, I think he's smiling ear to ear. And she's just marveling. You know, she's looking at him. This man just confessed to being the Messiah, told me everything I ever knew. And they're just looking and the disciples looking back. You know, I can see these guys looking back and forth. So again, they're like, do we say anything? No, don't say anything. Something's going on here. Are you sure? Because he's talking to a woman. No, just shh, something's happening. And they just stand there and they're quiet. And I don't know if this ever happened to you, but were you ever in, I'm sure you guys were, but there's a time where you're talking to someone and it's, it's holy, right? You're, you're, you're maybe you're witnessing or they're sharing your heart or you're sharing your heart and, and there's something going on and then you have that person coming you're like, oh, don't let them walk over here because you know they're going to be interrupt, right? Don't be that person. <laughs> and I'm sure at one point or another we were all that person when we've interrupted but just, just as I was reading through this, like, Lord, help me to be sensitive when I'm walking up to a conversation if there's something I, maybe I need to step back or maybe I need to have a holy reverence or maybe I just need to be praying for this conversation. And the disciples got the, the clue here. They don't get the clues very often, but they got the clues here. That something holy, something was going on that they just needed to be quiet. And remember, they didn't hear this whole conversation. They don't know what even happened yet. John must have talked to Jesus later or maybe even to her, and they told the story later. That that's how he would know to record this. So there's something happening here. You know, We read this and we know this. This is familiar, but for them... They don't know the story yet. They don't know what just transpired. <clears throat> so they come up. They see her. They're looking at each other, and she leaves. It says that she left her water pot in verse 28 and went away into the city. She left her water pot but left with a fountain. And she left dry, and she was overflowing. And I, I just can't but think this is what conversion looks like, that the things that were once important don't even matter. She left the water pot, and she runs into town. And I didn't put this in my notes, but I was reading through Matthew this week, and I, I, right after the Beatitudes, um, this was just her to me in, in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And that was her. I, I don't know when Sermon on the Mount happened compared to this. I think it's after. But whatever it was, I, she couldn't help but hold back. So I mean, there was no way she could hold back what just happened. She runs into town. And remember, she came up here in the middle of the day to be alone in the heat of the day. And now, after an encounter with Jesus, she runs back to the center of town to be the center of attention, to point that attention back to Jesus. Alone on a mountain, now in the middle of the town, pointing to Jesus. That's what real conversion looks like. And it's during those times when people get converted and it really hits you that I think it sets us on fire too, right? Like when, when that guy I was explaining, when, when he said that thing in the email, I was so excited. I'm like, oh, look what God did here. And I emailed it to my boss. She's like, I'm sending this up to the other bosses. And they send it all around and, you know, you get email. And everybody's excited because God did something. And all it was is I'm like, I don't have answers, but I know the guy that does. And that was it. And that's all she said. And I like how she puts it in verse, in verse 29. Come and see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Some people, there's, I hate how people like debate over stuff. Like that, don't, that doesn't really matter. But there's a debate that, um, did he really tell her everything? Is she exaggerating here? And who knows, right? It doesn't matter. Would you have wanted everything you've ever done wrong if you were with five guys and now on the sixth proclaimed in the scriptures? No. So I don't think whether he really told her everything she ever did or not. The thing was, is he was in, she was in his presence and that light shined into her darkness. And now what was hidden has now been exposed to her. And I don't know if you ever sat with the Lord and you were praying and you knew you were fully known at that moment. That there was no hiding what you have done, yet you were fully known, yet you were fully loved. And I think that's how she felt. And she runs back into town and says, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Now they knew who she was. And then she questions it. Could this be the Christ? And I don't think she's questioning at this point what would be the point of leaving the water pot running into town. I think she's saying, could it? Could this be? You know, she's getting their attention because that's what he did, right? He asked her question after question. He led her, led her along, you know, I have water to drink that you don't know about. What are you talking about? This well, you don't have anything to draw with. This well, I think he, she's doing the same thing, and, and, and she's trying to create an interest, but they're seeing such a drastic change in her. She's like, could this be the Christ? And they're excited, and they're going to go. And I just reminded, like, the truth had set her free. It didn't matter what her past was anymore. It's who she encountered that had changed her. Past didn't matter at this point. <clears throat> Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. And that was her. She no longer loved her life. She never longer worried about hiding or, or being separate, but she went into town and said, here's my testimony. And the town knew her testimony, but go to him. Um, and I, I put Matthew 16, 18 up there too, and, and there's a point. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Right before this, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Son of God. Right before her running into town, she got confessed to by Jesus that, she's, that he's the Christ. And so she runs into town. And it's a reminder that it's only a, your testimony is just your past sins. That's it. And Jesus set you free from those. And the reminder here is that sometimes, I just remember being a kid and growing up in the church, and I'm like, man, I don't have a powerful testimony. I don't have that. I don't have the, you know, I was a drug dealer, gangbanger, and got saved. But that's not the point. It's who we're pointing to, not what we've done. That's what's really important. And it says the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, and the gates were where strategy was committed. They can't overcome that. And one thing I've always noticed is people will argue Bible verses back and forth and they will debate about different scripture and what it means. But one thing they can't argue with you with, yeah, I said that right, I think, is your own testimony. They can't take that experience from you. And that can be good and bad in some cases. But when it comes to the change that was seen in her life, they couldn't argue what was different. <clears throat> so if you want a winning, winning strategy, just tell your testimony. And that's all it takes is she didn't have all the information, but what information she had, she shared. 
And it doesn't mean we have to know the Bible in and out, up and down, back and forth. But what we know is Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Son of God, that he came and he died for our sins. And that's it. So someone once said, if it takes over three minutes for you to tell the gospel, you've added too much. That's it. it, it Jesus died for us, he died for your sins, and you can be free. <clears throat> and so they come out of the city to see him. It says, then they went out of the city. Again, we didn't have, she didn't complicate things. She didn't make it. She's, she's, he's up there, the man that told me everything I ever did. And obviously there's something different. So they come out. That is amazing because remember, it was the middle of the day. So I don't know how long the conversation with Jesus took, maybe an hour. She runs back into town. It's in the middle of a work day, and they're coming out to meet him. They're leaving work because her testimony is so powerful. They're stopping whatever they're doing, and they're coming out to meet Jesus. And then we have this side conversation that is really important. Verse 31. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know. So again, in the meantime, this is meaning that there's a break. While she's in town doing this, he needs to get these guys <laughs> right at first. Because remember, this animosity between the Samaritans and them. So he's going to have to explain to them what's important. And he, again, he uses what's, what's before or the topic brought up and uses that to give a spiritual application. He said, but I said to them, I have no food to eat, food to eat which you do not know. And all I can think of is they must be looking back and forth at each other like, who brought him food? Who fed him? Did he sneak food in his pocket? He sends us all the way into town to get him food, and we come back here, and he says he has food? Like, I just, they're going back and forth and confused, and it just cracks me up how I, <laughs> I think these guys must have been so confused. But again, he, he does this on purpose. Jesus does this. He does this to Nicodemus, right? You must be born again. And Nicodemus, what do you mean be born again? I got to get back in the womb? This doesn't, what? But he's, he's creating interest. He did this to her at the well. I have water that you don't, you know, that you can't draw, or the fountain. I have this bubbling water that you don't know about. And she tells him, you don't have anything to draw with. He's bringing forth an, an object lesson. And I like how Jesus does that because it's the object's lessons when I was a little kid that I remember. You ever remember when you were in Sunday school, you remember some of the object lessons? I remember the little felt boards they used to use, and they would show the display of the nativity, and they would do David and Goliath. That's the things I remember. And Jesus does the same thing. So think about every time she went to the well after this. Did she just hope that he might be sitting there again? Or, man, I hope he's passing through again. And you think about this, disciples, you know, here he's talking about food, but after they break those baskets, imagine any time they picked up a basket again, they must have thought about it. Object lessons. Jesus does that. And he, he's just perfect at it. It's a good thing to do, good thing to do for kids. Again, that stuff sticks with you. And again, verse 33 through 34, there, therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. <clears throat> and it's just a reminder, are we more excited about what God has for us than the material? Because that's what he's saying to them. I, food is not important right at this moment. What just happened here was important, and I am nourished by it. Again, when, when you witness to somebody and something happens, you're sparked, you feel alive, you feel fired up, that should be way more important than the natural. And remember, as we talked about, he came to the well. It said he was, he was tired. The idea is he came back, he flopped back on those rocks. He was so tired, thirsty, hungry. And my guess, again, is it's Jesus. And as we see him throughout scriptures, he probably got up early to pray. And then they traveled all day long. <clears throat> and then he says, I'm going to do this till it's finished. And it's interesting, we know when he says it is finished, that's at the cross. The work was completed at the cross. It is finished. Uh, the word telestai, paid in full. My work is complete. So he's going to do his work all the way to the end. And it's a good reminder again. Um, I don't know what it is about the younger generation, but they, they like to tell us they're going to do things. Then they just don't do it. I'm, I'm sure you guys have had that happen at some point. They're like, I'll be there, I'll help you. And then you're like, where, where is everybody? Like, it's a good reminder. Jesus did this to the end. He did it to finish. So when you make a commitment, follow through on your commitment. I, so many times we've gone and helped people move, and it's the thing that nobody wants to do, right? Nobody wants to move. Nobody likes packing up. That's not fun. And people will be like, I'll be there, and then nobody shows up, right? 
If you, if you say something, say it, and then do it. Do it to completion. Do it till it's finished. Uh, it's a big pet peeve of mine. And All right, we'll keep moving on. 435. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white to the harvest. <clears throat> and what he's asking is, is this not your common phrase that you say? And it's, it's the opposite of idea when we say, don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. They're saying, ah, let's just wait. That was a common phrase. Just wait because it'll happen later. That was one of their common phrases. So uh, harvest is in four months. Let's just wait, right? So that, that was the idea. But Jesus says, behold, and when he says that, he's grabbing attention. We, we hear that word a lot in Scripture. But behold, he's like, look, pay attention. I need you to understand what I'm about to say. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. And it's a contrasting look. Not now, or not later, it's now. The Samaritans are coming now. There is a harvest now. And this really spoke to me. Because I have no doubt we are at the end, at the end of the ages. I, I have no doubt we are coming to the rapture of Jesus Christ, and we're going to come. So, if the harvest was white then, is it not more white now? That there is a reaping that needs to be done, and and we have a society that's lost and depressed and hurt. Uh, elections are on Tuesday this week. It's a good thing to go and vote because we want morality. But that's not the hope. The hope is to bring people to Christ. And if our hope is in the election and in this country, which, no, we want a moral country. Yes, we do. But then we have an idol in front of God. The hope should be that there is a harvest and we should look past that and look at the harvest and see who there is that we could witness to Christ. There's a couple of things that this hit me with this week. Because look at who Jesus used. It was the most immoral person in that town, it's my guess. She's the only one that came out at noon. So he used the most immoral person. So you are without excuse to say, the Lord can't use me because he used her. He crossed boundaries by going into Samaria. He crossed prejudice by going into Samaria. So don't look at a person and say, well, they can't relate to me. No, Jesus said, they can relate to you. There's a harvest. Go for it. I think the hardest people to witness to is family. I think they're the hardest ones to reach. But what he's saying is don't stop. Don't stop praying. Don't stop. And we're going to get to sowing and reaping. Continue to pray. Continue to seek. And he will bring the harvest. It's not up to for us to bring the harvest. He will bring the harvest. <sighs> so again... I was thinking back to, I, I mentioned to you guys the movie coming out, and I was just thinking about early Calvary Chapel. Chuck reached out to the most immoral lot of his day. That was the hippies. Sex, dr sex drugs, and rock and roll, right? That's what they all said, and he reached them. And it changed the church. didn't change the message of the church, but changed his church. And it exploded into a giant movement. What's the most immoral group we have out today? I'm asking. I don't know. I, the, the, the transgender, the LGBTQ, they're, they're, you know, they're on a whole other side. Are we trying to reach them? I mean, they're there. They're, they're lost. We know they're hurt. The depression rate is higher. The drug rate is higher. The homicide rate, the suicide rate, all in that community is higher. Are we trying to reach? Or do we say, no, I, I don't know how to reach them. It doesn't matter if we don't know how. We know who to point to. And that's, that was the whole point. As I, I read this and I thought through that, I mean, Chuck started a movement based off reaching the hippies. And it was actually his wife that did it. She's the one that said, hey, we should try to reach these people. And Chuck's like, no, they need a bath. I mean, <laughs> that was what he was saying. But, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't matter the differences. It mattered what became common, and that was Jesus. And there was hippies in church. And, and one of the common phrases around Calvary chapels is rip up the carpet. Because the hippies were coming in with dirty feet, bare feet, and they had just put new carpet in the church where he was at. And they were putting their feet all over, and the, the elders, you know, the old crusty guys in suits were like, you can't have this. And Chuck goes, well, rip up the carpet then, because I'd rather have the people in here than new carpet. 
And he was willing to sacrifice that. And I, I, I want that to be my heart. I want to go outside my comfort zone to reach somebody that I don't think I should reach. Because then when you reach them, you know it was all Jesus. So that's me and my rant. Verse 36. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for the eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. I'm, I'm going to keep reading. For in this saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. <clears throat> so this week at work, I was <laughs> thinking of this morning. Uh, we have a truck that comes to work that has shoes in it. And you can go and you can get a voucher, and my work will pay for my shoes. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. I'm getting free shoes. My work is paying for it. But it wasn't enough that my work just paid for the shoes. They paid me because I was on the clock while I went and got my shoes. And that was okay. They were okay with that. And I'm like, what a great deal. I'm getting paid and getting free shoes, like over $100 shoes for this. But this is the same thing. We, we rejoice in reaping and sowing. And we didn't do the work, really. We just pointed to Jesus. And we get rewards for it. This is a great deal. I remember a guy, I was a kid, and I remember... Uh, we were talking about uh, the armor of God, and it's and they were talking about how you put the armor on, you cinch it up, you get it on, and all that armor is from God. That's not from you. And that sword, that's God's sword. That shield, that's that's faith that He grants you. That that's all from Him. And then you go do the fighting, and He empowers you for the fighting, and then you get the reward. What a great deal! It's the same thing here. We get to go forth and tell people about Jesus Christ and point them to Him, and then it says we rejoice and we get rewards. And there's no greater reward I can think of than bringing someone to Jesus Christ. And it fires you up. You can tell I'm fired up. It fires you up. It fires them up. And then, then this fire spreads. I know we've all been, I think, I hope, we've all been praying for revival, especially for this county. This county is dark. Um, I don't remember if I shared this last week, but I had an article sent from my pastor that there's a, over 600% in the schools in Montgomery County of non-binary. What? what? Why is it so? What is going on? What is these kids being taught? It's so dark. They're so confused. But this brings light, and we can reach them because we have the most powerful message that there is. We can reach them, and then we get reward. And that's awesome. Great deal. Um, and then just to remember Isaiah 55. So, my, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Again, notice it's all God speaking there. My word, I, I, it's all on, on him. He's the one. It's his word that won't return void. Um, and then just to remember to be patient with it, 1 Corinthians 6 through 8. I planted, this is Paul speaking, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither who he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. Again, that there's a time you may plant, there's a time you may seed, but the reward, you still get a reward, and then we rejoice in the reward. Because the reward is the person. The reward is the woman at the well. That's the reward. And what did she do? She went into town and she brought the whole town forward. <clears throat> And this is the result here in verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. That's one. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. That's two. So her word of testifying who he was, and then his word confirmed it. And they said to the woman, this is beautiful, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves had heard him, and we know indeed that this is the Christ, the Savior of the world. He's not just, yes, he came for the Jews. Remember, he told them salvation is from the Jews. But what does he go in and tell them? What, what sermon does he give him that at the end of this, they're saying he is the Savior of the world. This just isn't for the Jews. This is for all of us. <clears throat> One thing I wrote down that, ha that hit me was with her, with the woman at the well, and this is it, we don't see her again, is that your past sins are your current testimony. Your past sins are your current 
testimony that those things that have happened in the past, which are past, are paid for blood bought, and now are a testimony, and all these people came forward and they confess that the Christ is the Savior of the world, that this man, that this guy who came to them. <clears throat> I remember for a long time, and I, I have lost the habit of it, but I used to carry Gospel of John's with me. And just little pocket Gospel of John's. And if somebody would say anything or we get into a conversation, I'd just be like, here, read this. And it, it's so simple. It's the Word of God. We give it to them. And then it's between them and the Lord, right? You're, you're kind of out of the picture. And that was the beautiful thing here. She pointed, and then the Lord spoke. And it was, it's an amazing thing, and it's just an easy thing. This phrase, Savior of the world, is only one other time in Scripture, and it's John again. And for we have seen and testify that the Father has set the Son as the Savior of the world. And I wonder if when he wrote this, he was thinking of this instance of the Samaritans, because he would have wrote this before he wrote the Gospel of John. Did he think of that? These people came out, the, the people that they rejected, the people he, he later wanted to call fire down from, that's where he gets the term son of thunder, that they came out and they called him savior of the world. <clears throat> so they, they convince him to stay. He stays for two days, verse 43 through 45. Now after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee, where Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they had also gone to the feast. Now he's making a point here, and this next miracle, I think, is, is the point. He's going back home to where he came from. Now, if you remember, I believe it was the end of chapter 2, it says he did a lot of miracles in Jerusalem. We don't know what they were, but it said he did a lot of miracles. So the people that were in Galilee, because remember, we said all, everybody's coming down for the Passover. Everybody, all the males over 18 were required to be there. So they saw the miracles. They probably saw him tossing the tables. And so they, they run to him. They want a sign. They want a miracle. And that's why he's saying there's, there's no honor here. You just want a show. I'm, I'm not here to give a show. <clears throat> he once again, he wants what the Samaritans said. For we ourselves have heard him. Because that was the testimony that they gave. They had heard him. He wants them to live by word. And again, I think this next miracle points out is an is, uh, object lesson again for what was being said here. Verse 4, 46 through 47. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus came out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So he came from Capernaum. That's about 20 miles a day uh, away. So maybe a half day's ride, whole day's walk, I'm not sure. Um, so roughly about a day's journey. He was a nobleman. The, the, literally, that means a royal person. More than likely, again, debate, more than likely he came from Herod's court. He's, he's part of Herod's. He could be a centurion. There's another healing where Jesus heals a centurion, and he heals him from a distance, but that's about all that's the same. Then, then this kind of diverts a little bit. And it changes. I don't think it's the same instance. So this man comes. He's a nobleman. He's royal. And he's coming as a father, a heartbroken father. And again, death and sickness are a great equalizer, right? He's probably tapped out all his resources. He has nothing left. He has heard of this miracle worker. So he rides down to Jesus. And it says he implored him to come down and heal his son. That's That word implore means he's begging and continuing to beg. He is not stopping. Jesus, please, please come to my son. Please heal my son over and over again. It's this imploring. And now you have another contrast where we have the Samaritan woman. We don't even get her name. We don't lowest of society to a nobleman elevated and up. And now he is imploring Jesus. And this next part seems kind of kind of harsh, but I think when we look at it, it'll make more sense. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe Again, I think this is directed at the crowd. This isn't necessarily at him and the crowd, but they're imploring him to, to do a sign. They're begging him. The, the father's begging him, but the crowd just wants a sign. They just want to show. So I think Jesus does this the way it is uh, because of that. And there's a lot of that today. I'm going to take a drink. This faith healing and this... Uh, desire for a show, who who has the best worship team, who has the best speaking, 
when, when again, it all just comes back to the scripture. It all comes back to Jesus. That's what we want. And sensationalism, sensationalism based on faith is superficial. So if it's all about miracles, if it's all about a show, then it's, it, there's no substance behind it. And then if you think about the Jews after they left Egypt, right? They had sign after sign after sign, miracle, water in, water in the blood. They had the locusts. They had the darkness. They had the child building being killed. They walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. They come out the other side. Pillar of fire at night, cloud by day, food every day. And then they get to the mountain where the law comes down and they create another God. And they create a golden calf. So signs and miracles are not a good basis for faith. The Antichrist will come doing lying signs and wonders. So if you're based in signs and wonders, you're going to miss the truth. And like like he told her, like he told the woman at the well, in spirit and in truth, that's how we should be worshiping the Lord. It should be a, a balance of both. So don't be looking for signs and miracles. They're great when they happen. It's great. I can't say I've ever seen one that I can think of off the top of my head. But it, our faith should never be based in that thing because it will never, never be enough. We should be more like Job. And I wrote what Job said. Though he slay me, still will I trust him. And we get this entire book of a man who refused to cure. His wife walks up to him, covered in scabs and sores and friends, just not being any help, really. And he says, though he, his wife comes out and says, why don't you just curse God and die? He says, no, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's the heart of God. I, I like a book I read a while ago talked about God's champion. And if you look at when a lot of the miracles are done in the Bible, like if you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, even if he won't save us, we're not going to bow. Throw us in the fire. Do it. Burn us up. We don't care. Because it doesn't matter. We're not going to bow down. And then they go in the fire and the miracle happens, right? But they didn't care about the miracle. The, the champion was the person who says, God, no matter what happens, no matter how the circumstance comes out, I will not bow the knee to another. You are God alone, and in you I will trust. That's what a true champion, and I believe God lifts those people up like he did to Job. We have a whole book on him, and, and says, here is my champion before Satan, before everybody. This is the person I have called. This is a true person after, like David, a person after my heart. All of David's failings, we would say, this is a man after my own heart. And why was David a man after God's own heart? Because he never went to another God. He might have messed up and sinned along the way. Not might, we know he did. But God still raised him up at the end and said, this is a man after my own heart. So no matter your failings, David never turned from me. He always came back to me, and when he always repented and came before me. <clears throat> So verse 4, 49 through 51, The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to, to him, Go your way, your son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. When the man says, Sir, come down before my child dies, that, one is li that term is little one, my dear one. It's the same one when uh, Jesus raises the little girl, uh, from the dead. It's, it's a little dear one, a little, probably very young is the idea, probably maybe toddler age. It's, and then Jesus says, your son will live. So he says, my little one, my dear one, Jesus says, your son will live. <clears throat> and the man says, come down. And Jesus says, go. And he responds in belief. And it seems like it must have took him some time to get back there because again, it's the next morning. It seems like he gets there because it says, um, in verse 52, then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, yesterday, so it's the next day, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour which Jesus said, your son lives, and he himself believed, and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea of Galilee. So the nobleman believes, and he responds, and then he sees the miracle. And then he recognizes that the miracle happened the moment that Jesus spoke. Again, it was the word of God that, that changed it. He, wasn't, he just responded. He just believed. It said, and I, I love that because he didn't, this whole crowd is clamoring for a miracle and Jesus says, just believe and go. And he, and he does. Oh, goodness. Sorry. And that was very distracting. <laughs> but he goes down out of belief and goes down 
because he listened to the word of God. And it should be the same with us. We go because he commanded, not because we're looking for him to do something. There was a lot of stuff I felt in here, and I had a feeling I'd be a little quicker, but um, it just moved me how there's a harvest out here, and Jesus shows us how to do it. And he shows us how to inquire, how to ask questions, how to, how to create interests, but mostly how to get to the heart, right? We want to get to the person's heart and show them that they're lacking, and that's what Jesus did. He showed the disciples, you're, you're looking for the physical, and I've got something spiritual. He told the woman at the well, you're, you're looking for substance. You've been looking in all the wrong places, but I have it. And there's a world that's lost, and they're doing the same thing. They're looking, and we can see it over and over again. They're so caught up in, in things that really don't matter. And all we have to do is point them to Jesus. And that's what this just really spoke to me this week as I went through this study. Because when his word comes out, he changes things. And I, I think I said it last week, but I'll say it again. I think it was uh, C.S. Lewis that said, um, we don't have to defend scripture, we just have to unleash it, right? And it's the same. So just let scripture speak. Continue to pray for those you've been praying for for years, family, friends. Look for the one that's the lost, the one that's too far, the, right? That, the one that you don't think he can get to because he can. And he would love to prove you wrong in that. I think he would. So uh, let's close in prayer. Father, I, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, for... Um, just this example, this, just your display of your heart, Lord, and help us to see, Lord, show us, like the song says, Lord, give us your eyes. Help us to see those who are hurting, those who are lost, whether we're in the supermarket or uh, walking, Lord, whatever it is, show us, Lord. There is a world that just needs you, and, and we would love to have the privilege, Lord, to just serve you in that way. So use us, guide us, speak through us. Um, and just give us a heart and a love for people, Lord. I thank you and praise you for this time. Again, may you just receive these songs, this worship. And uh, I bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen.